I want to introduce to you a man of many talents. Not only is he the co-creator and executive producer of the Emmy Award winning, unfailingly brilliant Phineas and Ferb. I love that show. He is also the voice behind the evil, inept um, Dr. Doofenshmirtz on that show. Please help me welcome the great Dan Povenmire. So I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, of all places, uh, which was not a environment that was conducive to creativity in, in any real way. The, the adults in the Deep South just don't know what to say to a child with artistic aspirations other than, you know, there's a reason they call them starving artists. It's because they're starving, which I found very helpful. Um, and, uh, but then in, in the 11th grade, I had a teacher named Mr. Mitchell. He was a, he was a tall man with a, with a uh, perpetually stern expression and a big 70s mustache. He looked sort of like a cross between Sam the Eagle and the Swedish chef. <laughs> I, I don't know why only Muppets come to mind, but, 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 you, but you get the idea. And one day in his class, he was asking the students what they wanted to do with their lives after they graduated, what they were gonna do. And he got to me and I said, I wanted to move to Los Angeles. I wanted to work in entertainment. I wanted to direct. And a bunch of kids in the back row sort of snickered at that. And Mr. Mitchell said, hey, what's wrong with you? I think Pavanmeyer's funny. You don't think Pavanmeyer's funny? If there's anybody in this class who can do that, it's Pavanmeyer. And I realized that was the first time that an adult other than my parents, had told me they thought they could, that I could make a living doing something creative. And that was, a, that was, in retrospect, a huge moment in my life. And after, after I graduated, I, I moved out here, and I, I did everything I could to get into the entertainment industry. But of course, as we know, there's no real way to get into the end, entertainment industry. And, and, but I had always been able to draw, so I was taking art uh, art gigs. I, I did a comic strip uh, for a while, and I did uh, I did caricatures on Olvera Street, and did freelance graphic stuff. I did a bunch of freelance from my home, including finally I started working on the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles doing storyboard cleanup. Meaning I would get a storyboard that was all drawn in blue pencil, very rough, and I would put nice clean lines on it. And I did that for, for the better part of a, of a year, and suddenly I was making sort of steady money. And, uh, and then the season order for the, for the new Ninja Turtles stopped, and that work stopped, and I had the hardest time finding any other work. It was just like the town was dry. I was knocking on doors, I was making phone calls. Nobody was offering me any work at all. And I watched my meager savings just dwindle down and down and down. Six months, I didn't work at all. And I felt like, oh, I was asking friends, do you, you think I'm talented, right? I can, you know, and, and it got down to $400 in my savings account. And that was it. That's all I had to my name out here. And all of that was going to be gone by the first of the year. Uh, not the first of the year, the first of the month for, uh, for rent. And, and so, so I had less than 30 days left before I am completely destitute out here. I start thinking about what it would be like to move back to Mobile and move in with my parents and how discouraging that would be and, and would I ever get the gumption up to come back out here and try this again? And I just didn't even know the answer to that, to that question. And just at that moment, two things miraculously happened almost simultaneously. I got hired to draw on a TV show called The Simpsons, uh, and I got hired to write a screenplay for Psycho Cop 2, colon, Psycho Cop Returns. <laughs> Which, <laughs> apparently there were a lot of unanswered questions in Psycho Cop 1, but, but the producers weren't sharing those questions with me, so I didn't think I would be answering them in the sequel. Still. The same, I got, uh, I got hired to write a screenplay for a feature that was actually going to get made and work on a number one hit TV show. And I felt like this is the beginning of my career. This is my big break. This is where it all starts. 
And in retrospect, that was it. That was the moment where, where my career really started. But at, the, at that time, I was thinking suddenly about Mr. Mitchell's class and about that time where he had given me this vote of confidence. And I thought, I need to tell Mr. Mitchell this. For some reason, it became very important to me to thank him for that. So I called directory assistance and I got his number and I, and I called and I got his wife and she said he was in the hospital for back problems. And I said, well, could I, if I wrote him a letter, would you take it into him? And she said, oh yes, of course. So then I got, I, I went to the drugstore and I got an envelope and a piece of paper and a stamp, all this paraphernalia you needed in the dark ages before email just to correspond with other human beings. And I, and I hand wrote a letter saying how much that moment in his class had meant to me and, and telling him what was going on in my life now. And I put it in the mail and I sort of forgot about it and started doing the, the work that I had been hired to do. And then six months, eight months maybe later, I get a phone call on a Saturday, I'm home, and the phone rings, and I say, hello? He's like, Dan Povenmire, this is Jim Mitchell. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, how are you doing? I thought, well, I'm doing great, uh, Dan. I've, just, I've, been, I've been meaning to call you for quite some time. You see, uh, you saved my life. I saved your life? How did, how did I save your life? Well, you know when you called, my, my wife told, me, told you that, um, I was in the hospital for back problems, and that was, that was a lie of sorts. I had had what you people in California refer to as a nervous breakdown. He had been, he had been hit by this big bout of depression that, that he couldn't get over, and, and he said it was all brought about by, by a couple of things, the biggest of which was that he felt like never had he reached any of his, his students in any real way. He felt like he'd never made a difference in any of their lives. And so he's hospitalized for depression. He's at the lowest point in his life. And his wife walks in with my letter, telling him how much of a difference I had made in his life. And it got him up, it got him out, the, out of the hospital and got him back to teaching, which is where he belongs. Now there's a footnote to this story. There's, there's a footnote to this story because uh, in 2004, I was directing on Family Guy, so you, it really was the start of a, a career. And I was also contributing to the Family Guy blog. And I, I, um, I wrote down that story that I've just told you, the story of how my career started and how that letter saved Mr. Mitchell's life. And I posted it, and the next morning, I check my email and there's an email from one of the blog followers, a personal email from one of the blog followers, and the subject line is, Two Lives, Dan. And I opened it up and it's, it was a very emotional email about how four, or, or four years earlier she had uh, been the victim of a violent crime and she had had a lot of psychological trauma because of it, which she had never looked for help on at all, and she had descended into depression and anxiety and agoraphobia, and she had tried to kill herself. And she had not left her house in nine months, had not even gone outside in nine months, and she had friends staying with her on rotation in, uh, in a in sort of suicide watch. And one of those friends was a fan of Family Guy on Adult Swim, and he turned it on and she said, I don't wanna watch cartoons. And he said, this one's different, I think you'll like it. <laughs> and she watched it sort of begrudgingly and then she started laughing out loud. And it was an episode I had directed. And she said, she said that laughing out loud had made her feel human again. That it had connected her to the rest of the world in a way that she couldn't do by herself. And she started living every day to make it to nine o'clock at night to see the next episode of Family Guy on Adult Swim. And that's not nothing. And she got up out of, out of her bed, she started socializing, she started having a life again, she looked for help for, for her problems. And I always share this with people in the, in the entertainment industry because we, especially comedy writers, like to talk very self-deprecatingly about what we do as, 
as being sort of self-serving and very trivial. We just write silly jokes for a living. But what we do is we entertain the entire world. And, and who's to say who else out there is in a desperate situation like this woman's where just, just, seeing a, just having your, your spirits lifted will make a big difference in your life and, or save your life. Uh, I have saved two people's lives by the Heimlich Maneuver. <laughs> I've used the Heimlich Maneuver twice in my life. One of those guys, I made him choke. So <laughs> I told him a joke while he was eating a Twix bar. He got stuck in his throat, and I saved him. But I don't get credit for that. That's a wash. So I've really only saved one person's life with the Heimlich Maneuver. And apparently, I've saved two people's lives just by having a career in television. So scientifically, that proves that, that making good television is twice as effective at saving lives as the Heimlich Maneuver. <laughs> so the takeaway I want to give you for this, especially for the people in this room, is to go back out there and save more lives. And uh, by all means, if someone has saved your life or changed your life, let them know, even if you have to go to the store and get an envelope and a stamp. Thank you.